Uh, I'd like to thank Dom. It's great to be here. Um, this is, it's not quite the first time I've given this, but I was, I've been giving more or less probably various on the same talk um, while I'm in Melbourne, so I thought I'd do something slightly different. Um, and what I want to talk about is just sort of basically thinking about how we can improve our design of dissemination implementation strategies. Um, I think in the field that this is probably the weakest part of implementation science over the 30-year period, and I think we need to do a better job. But I thought I'd start off with um, greetings from Ottawa. Um, so uh, Ottawa is the federal capital of Canada. So that's probably your pub quiz hint uh, from this talk. Just remember that. What's the, uh, what's the capital of Canada? It's Ottawa. It's not Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver. Um, but we have running through the city uh, um, uh, basically a canal. Um, and the, um, uh, it's uh, 7.9 kilometers long. And in the winter, we allow the canal to get to drop its level and skate. And this is the archetypal um, Ottawa experience. So Dom is thinking about maybe coming north next year. So if she wants to come around January or February, it's going to be minus 20 in this. So you know, I, I think you have to embrace Canada. Okay. I'll bring it <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, as, as Dominic said, I, I've spent the last uh, 27, 28 years working in implementation research. Um, and this is kind of what motivates me. Uh, when you look uh, at repeated studies around the world between, uh, uh, that compare what we should be doing according to the evidence and what healthcare systems and healthcare professionals manage to deliver, there is a significant gap. And this is across all areas of, us, all areas of healthcare, all healthcare professionals. These are studies done in uh, North America, Europe, Australia, Asia, Africa, um, South America. There isn't a healthcare system that you can go to where they've got this right. Okay, so even when we think about very high performing healthcare systems like Kaiser Permanente, they're struggling with this. The VA, they're struggling with this. So these repeated studies show that between 30 to 40% of patients don't get treatments we know are probably effectiveness. And around 20 to 25% of patients get care that's not needed or is potentially harmful. So we're not maximizing the value of both research and then healthcare for our patients if there are these gaps. And this suggests that implementation of research findings that it's a fundamental challenge for healthcare systems to optimize care, costs, and outcomes. Um, I think the key issue is it's not easy. If it was easy, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be a GP um, and, and during my life. Um, as far as being an implementation researcher, having to come to Melbourne during, uh, during my winter um, is a great hardship. Um, but it's not easy. And I think this reflects kind of both the complexity of healthcare these days, complexity of our patients. Um, you know, probably 50, 60 years ago, it didn't really matter what we did because we didn't have anything that was particularly effective. Now we have potentially very effective drug uh, treatments, but also they've got arms and just poor organization, given the complexity, is, is hard to optimize care. So um, if we look at how traditionally people have designed uh, uh, quality improvement interventions, uh, Martin Eccles, who's a, a, a very close um, a friend and colleague, talked about the ISCIAP principle. People have seen the ISCIAP principle before? Okay, some of you have, some of you haven't. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, often in hospitals or in primary care organizations, you bring together a group of very experienced staff, um, and basically they sort of sit in a room and try and identify what they can do to improve the quality of care for X. Uh, and normally, whoever's speaking longest and loudest or has got the most gray hair, um, um, their, their ideas come to the fore. Um, but there's often very little discussion about, well, why do you think that intervention is going to be helpful? Healthcare professionals are very good at jumping to solutions. You know, this is kind of how we've been trained to think, and we just always go to a solution. Uh, and the problem is that often, um, particularly in the implementation field, um, we haven't, you know, the solutions don't really match to what we think the problem is, okay? So um, um, I would argue that intervention design is when the Achilles heel of implementation science. Many interventions are poorly justified, inadequately designed, and poorly reported. Uh, and I've, I'm guilty of this. I've done studies where, you know, frankly, we've just sort of sat around the room and said, okay, what are we going to do, and tried things out. 
But I think the fact that we have not done a good job of inter designing interventions and then reporting them, it actually hinders the development of the scientific basis for implementation. So if we don't know what we're testing, then it's very hard to start to sort of say, are the generalized effects when we test these different constructs or mechanisms. And also the translation of implementation research into healthcare systems. So as knowledge of, of implementation research matures and we want healthcare systems to adopt it, if we're not very good at describing what we're doing, um, then it's not going to be easy for the healthcare system to pick those things up. So I think the question is, can we do better than is the app? And I, I think we can. Um, and I'm going to sort of basically describe a process which is mainly about trying to be systematic and explicit and surface your ideas as you go forward and design your interventions. Um, I've spent, uh, for probably the last 20 years, have, have, have identified um, the problem of implementation as being one about uh, the need to change behaviors of individuals who are working or being cared for in complex systems. So in general, implementation is going to require someone to change their behavior, to do something new, to stop doing something. Mm -hmm. And if we want to change behavior, it will help to understand um, how behavior changes. When we start to think about this in the field with a behavioral lens, um, um, it opens up something like 100 years of modern psychology, 50 years of modern sociology and organizational sciences. It kind of extends the perspectives that we can bring to bear on the problems that we have. Um, I'm going to use this as, a, as an organizing framework. This is a piece of work that um, came out of a project that we did at Monash with uh, the Australasian Cochrane Center led by Simon French at the time. Um, and we just came up with a four-stage process for designing interventions. First of all, identify who needs to do what differently, you know, uh, particularly specifying that behaviorally. Then using a theoretical framework, identify which barriers and enablers need to be addressed. Then which intervention components could overcome the modifiable barriers and enhance enablers, and then how will we make a change? I should say I'm very happy for the slides to be circulated. So I think it's going to go onto a website anyway, but you know, feel, you know, um, um, Sally will be able to um, distribute the slides. Um, I'm not going to talk much about identifying who needs to do what differently, uh, except to say that often in healthcare systems, people make the problems very abstract. Uh, and that often makes it kind of quite hard to break it down or, or to, to actually know how to address them. So um, um, I did a, a, I, many years ago, I came to the women's um, uh, hospital in Melbourne um, and spoke to their quality group. And they said, our number one problem is that we have poor active third stage of labor. Um, and basically starting to get them to specify, well, what does that actually mean? What, does that, what would have to change in the clinical environment for that problem to be, um, um, and to be addressed actually started to change the, the tenor of the conversation because it made it much more practical. So I will often start by really trying to understand what it is in the clinical environment that needs to change, what's happening in the clinical environment trying to prevent that. But having done that, with having specified the problem in behavioral terms, then um, uh, uh, we want to identify the bias and enablers. Um, so um, we've done a lot of work using this framework, the theoretical domain framework. Have people heard of this one? So um, Susan Meekey um, is an amazing scientist. She uh, is um, a professor of health psychology at University College London. And she felt very passionately that her discipline could contribute to basically making smarter choices about how to try and improve the quality of care and improve public health. But she also recognized that the way that psychology organized care and improved public health. But she also recognized that the way that psychology organized itself is actually a barrier to non-psychologists using it. So you have multiple theories. Many of them are not particularly well validated, so should probably never be thought of. Um, but even with the really um, um, uh, with, with well validated theories, they have overlapping constructs, but they use different language. So two of the sort of major social cognition theories, the social cognitive theory developed by Bandura, he talked about self-efficacy, and uh, theory of plan behavior developed by um, Eisen and Fisbein, and they talk about perceived behavioral control. And I don't know if there's any psychologists in the world, but you know, for mere mortals, they look pretty identical. Um, you know, probably these two theories would fight, you know, tooth and nail to say they're different ideas, but 
we have fundamentally the idea that um, our beliefs about whether we can actually enact a behavior, influence the likelihood we take that behavior, is something that seems to be general around that. So Susan, um, basically to address this, uh, took 130 odd constructs from the 28 best uh, or 30 best theories uh, and did a range of consensus processes when she said, how many unique ideas are there in psychology that suggest or that drive our behavior? And out of 128 constructs, they came to 14 theoretical domains, 14 ideas that psychology says drive our behaviors. Now, the value of this is that it's a kind of comprehensive view of what of psychology is one discipline is relevant and what that thing can change our behavior. If you look at this, there may be some terms you don't recognize, but actually if we work through them, you shouldn't be surprised that what's here. You know, if you actually think it through, a lot of these things would be things you'd expect to be there um, rather than anything else. Um, but the value for this, I think, is twofold or threefold. The first is it does provide a common set of ideas and language that will help communication. Um, the second is it is comprehensive from a psychology perspective about what drives behaviors. Uh, and the third is um, Susan and colleagues developed a qualitative interview schedule um, that would allow you to, in a 30-minute interview with a healthcare professional, basically go through all of these domains, identify which are the key ones, and then which ones um, uh, and key beliefs within those domains that might need to be addressed or challenged in an intervention. So it's, it's very useful, I think, from that perspective. Um, it is, I mean, all models are wrong, some are useful. I think it's useful. I think it's worthwhile exploring this. It may be in 10 years' time we have better models than this, but it's a good starting point. So, yeah, we can do an, we can do an interview study where we um, um, try and identify what the barriers and facilitators are, and then we have to think about um, um, how do we address interventions to overcome those barriers. And again, I'm going to highlight some work by Susan Leakey. She also observed the psychologists were not very good at describing what they did if they were trying to change behavior. But again, there wasn't a shared language for doing this. So she, um, again, drew up in social consensus and identified 93 behavior change techniques. So the, 93, the behavior change techniques are sort of the minimal active units of behavior change. And in general, so they're like the behavior change atoms that we can then use to help build behavior change interventions, OK? Um, and you know, my guess is that if we went through this, there would be things you hadn't thought about. There would be things that would surprise you. And you probably in your head could not keep 93 things at one point in time unless you are truly superhuman. And each of these, um, 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 ha each of these um, behavior change techniques has got a specific um, uh, uh, definition. So graded tasks, set easy tasks, increase difficulty until the target behavior is performed. If you like, that comes from sort of things like creeping phobias. So yeah, just for Sandy's knowledge, there's a spider in the room next door. Um, by next week, we'll be able to have spiders running all over her head, and she'll be fine. Um, um, but you could think about how could you actually adopt that within a clinical setting, within a clinical frame. You know, you may not have to sort of say, we'll do something for 100% of patients tomorrow, but we might start to sort of say, we're going to practice in patients that we will start using uh, a new behavior or technique in patients where we feel comfortable about using it to build our confidence to move forward. Uh, so more work by Susan Leakey. Um, I do occasionally say she's a Scottish guard living in, uh, in London. Um, uh, but um, this is uh, early work that Susan did and it's proof of principle. Um, but I think it's, it's, it shows the direction that we need to go through. So we've identified domains that are about the barriers and facilitators that drive our behaviors. We've identified behavior change techniques about how we could change behavior. Not all behavior change techniques are equally applicable across domains. If you want to change skills, you do something different than if you want to change knowledge. So what we really need is kind of some major matrix that links these things together. And that's what Susan and her colleagues did in this paper. Um, Susan is a very, very serious scientist, says this is the worst science she's ever done because there's basically consensus with five other people. So I see this as a proof of principle. And this is what they did. Um, so what you have uh, along the top 
it are the domains, and it's, it's, an, it's an early version of behavior change, uh, uh, sorry, uh, directly the main framework. So there's 11 domains, and this is an early version of the behavior change taxonomy. The white boxes are um, when the, everyone agreed that this could be a useful behavior change technique for changing this domain. And the crosshatch box were where people didn't think it would be helpful. The, um, uh, the black box is where they just disagreed with thought. Um, and then the, uh, and, and the, the line box is where they said, we actually just don't feel we have enough knowledge to say anything. But if you think, if you, you can look across this in the row, so um, specify a goal or target. Um, is a behavior change technique, and that's going to be useful for three, which is skills, and um, six, which is motivation and goals, and 11, which I can't see, it's just off the bottom of the slide. If you were into, if you identified skills in issue, this would give you maybe 10 behavior change techniques, which could be your shortlist to think about what are the kind of approaches that we should use within this particular setting for this problem. And I liken this to those recipe books that say lamb goes together well with rosemary and garlic and anchovies. It doesn't tell you how to cook the lamb, but it starts to sort of say, here are things that you could think about that maybe are more likely to work than just sort of starting with this list and sort of making it up yourself. So this is where I think we're trying to get to. Uh, and it will allow us to start to be a lot more explicit within our, um, within our um, um, setting. The one thing to say is, um, if you look at this four-stage model, my experience in healthcare settings is that people tend to jump to stage three. Okay, they jump to the solution without understanding what the problem is. And one of the values of this model is it says, think about these sort of, you know, think about these things systematically as you move forward. The final thing I just wanted to mention before I go into a case study is. Um, what I've described so far is about really building a very strong program theory and so if you like technical design. But even if you've got that, your intervention may fail if it isn't designed to fit the context and the target audience you're going to go to. So that good design still matters. And we're increasingly, um, and I shall give you the demonstration uh, in the case example, working with human factors user centered design um, experts as one who built our logic model, actually working with people who can think about how to engage with the audience and basically sort of try and deliver an intervention that's more likely to be effective. So I want to give you a case study and just describe how we've used this. So um, this is uh, something called the Ireland study, and it's uh, the co-PI is really in uh, Ibis and J.D. Schwarm, and it's funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. If we go to our French model, um, if we think about who needs to do what differently, the issue that we're trying to deal with here is that um, there's fairly consistent international evidence that uh, 12 months after individuals have had a heart attack, they are not taking preventive drugs. And these are probably some of the most effective drugs that you, we've got. Um, you take four drugs continuously, you reduce your risk of another heart attack within 12 months by about 80%. So it's kind of pretty big health gains. There's very few things in health where you can have, you know, you're going to get that reward. But this is a, a population data from Ontario um, showing for three of the drugs in ACE inhibitor, beta block, or statin. You know, at the individual drug level, you're sort of getting down to about sort of 70% um, uh, or well, 70, between 70 and 80% at 365 days. But if you sort of say you need all the three of those and um, aspirin, you know, the figures around about 50%. Okay, so this is a big problem, but if we could actually improve compliance, this is likely at a population level to actually have demonstrable effects. The other thing you might notice is that there's kind of drop-offs at certain points in time. And the way um, the Canadian pharmacy works is you basically, uh, um, and I can't remember how it works in Australia, but you can get basically repeats, um, which sort of, you know, basically you, you give your prescription to the pharmacist and you can go back a few months later to the next aliquot, a few months later to the next aliquot. And it does look about as though a lot of these drop-off occurs when these repeats happen, you know, when you should be going to the pharmacies to fill your repeats. So what we wanted to do in this intervention was um, to uh, see if we could provide prompts uh, uh, for the first 12 months of um, uh, a patient sort of a patient's journey after they've had a heart attack around the time it should be repeating. 
to see if we can kind of like encourage them to continue to get more data, uh, 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 more drugs. So, you, uh, so using a theoretical framework with bias and labels need to be addressed. Where we uh, 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 and the paper, this paper is reporting in, in psychology and health. Uh, we actually did two different approaches. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but one is that we did um, um, theoretical domain framework interviews with 24 patients, and then we actually did um, telephone interviews based on the health action process approach, which is a, a psychological model um, uh, with 201 patients. And we collected data with patients when they're you know, within the first couple of weeks of their, their heart attack, 3 to 12 weeks, 13 to 24, 25 to 36. And one of the ideas is that people's views might change over time. You know, if I'm sitting in hospital having had my MI, then of course I'm going to be really, really good at saying I'll take my pills, I really will take my pills. Six months later, I'm back in the workforce, you know, life is very busy, it may not feel the same. You know, and the motivations may not feel the same. So we want to try and get some sense about what's a, a progression over time. What we found in the theoretical domain framework is that the key domains were beliefs about consequences, um, memory retention. So, so a lot of people didn't know that actually these were profoundly effective drugs that could have a real benefit for the health. Memory retention decision processes, people just forgot, life is busy. Oh yeah, I didn't get my refills. Mm. Um, behavioral regulation, um, um, you know, whether people had sort of mechanisms for trying to ensure that they actually uh, uh, um, filled their prescriptions, social influence and social identity, whether people around them, whether their families were supporting them or encouraging them to do this. Uh, and in HAPA, social support and action planning, which does fit into CDF, but it, it just was uh, more highlighted within that. So which intervention components could overcome the modified bias and enhance enablers? So at one level, building stronger motivation. So addressing the issue about beliefs about consequences, um, uh, in other words, uh, uh, outcome expe expectancies, using a credible source, provide information about health and social consequences of taking medication or not, and highlighting the salience of the consequences. Beliefs about capabilities, demonstrate you know, the techniques that we could use for demonstration of behavior, verbal persuasion about capability of providing feedback on behavior. Social role, identification of self as a role model and reframing how the behavior is viewed. In terms of turning motivation into action, getting people to develop explicit action coping plans, getting people to bring or develop social support for them, and behavioral regulation, encouraging people to think about problems to use, adding objects to the environment, and promoting self-monitoring of the behavior. Um, now, we had decided when we were going to do this, that the intervention was going to be based on a, a mail out to patients intermittently over time. Um, you might argue that uh, you know, could we have done this electronically or not, um, but you know, our healthcare system doesn't routinely ca um, capture things like um, email, um, so that we you know, post is reliable in general get to people's houses. We may not have the right addresses, so there's that problem, but we felt that at this point in time, it was potentially reliable. So having developed what hopefully you'll get a sense of kind of a strong program theory, there's an issue about well, how could we develop some sort of postal communication that would address these areas. And so we worked with a group called Pivot, um, which is um, um, a design, um, a, a design, um, uh, a group who are used to doing a lot of social marketing. And this is a paper that's just come out in Journal of Medical International Internet Research. Um, and one of the interesting things is when we talk about negotiating, negotiating tensions between theory and design, we had developed this theoretical perspective, but a lot of user design centered design approaches are they're kind of theory informed, but pretty a theoretical and there's a set of techniques that they want to just jump in and do stuff. And we had to kind of come back and say, well, actually, we, we've already done a lot of that kind of ideas and those thinking, but we want the intervention to collect these, in, these, these components of what we've got. So we ended up with um, uh, 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 mailings out at sort of one, two, five, and 11 months following heart attack. And we, uh, the behavior change were fixed. Um, but Pivot did some additional user-centered design with 10 patients representing a range of age, time from heart attack, gender, and ethnicity. I just want to show you the kind of um, uh, uh, the materials we brought and how we embedded uh, techniques into them. So um, 
Harm Stroke Canada uh, didn't want to brand this, but were happy for us to say that this was part of a, they were a collaborator on this project. So we'd argue there's some credibility of the source there in terms of using it. Um, in terms of salient, um, uh, uh, salient information, um, 10 out of 100 people will die in their first year after a heart attack. 8 out of 10 can be saved with proper treatments. And we did, a, we, we did some very interesting, kind of had a very interesting discussion about how to represent the data. If you're developing a decision aid and want to sort of express values and preferences, you should provide the 400 and then sort of basically do the 8 and the 2. But we, to some extent, want to be, you know, we were kind of, we want to be a bit more forceful than that. We actually want to really get people to think about this. So, yeah, we, you know, if you look at this, you maybe think like, well, if we were doing this in a, as a shared decision aid, uh, uh, like, oh, that wouldn't be good practice. But we made very conscious decisions about what we're trying to do within this. Whether it's right or wrong, but we have very few areas of medicine where this is such a profound effect. Um, we had uh, um, um, goal setting. So, you know, getting people to think about sort of basically, you know, what they want to do in the future. And you can also see provision, provision of knowledge. Um, you know, one of the things that came through interviews was that people still didn't have a good sense about what medication they're on and why they're on it. Yeah, and why this is going to be useful for that. Um, it definitely hasn't been easy um, all the time, but it's been almost a year since my heart attack. I'm proud of the trains I've made. Sure, I fall off the track sometimes, but then my family reminds me of what's important. Mm -hmm. So kind of modeling of something, but also saying you can engage your family, you know, kind of just sort of putting something in there. And um, you can see this looks like it's a relatively young couple. Um, yeah, we have, if you look across the materials, we've got young and older, because I think we started off where it was largely sort of more older people and kind of younger people than I said, well, that doesn't relate to me. So, yeah, we're in design phase, we're sort of thinking about, okay, well, how do you sort of make sure anyone can look across these documents and feel that it is relevant to the, to me? I'm sure also we had kind of different ethnicities, Canada, like Australia, is a highly um, multi-ethnic um, group. Um, action planning. Take your pills every day. When will you take your pills? Where will you take them? How will I remember to take my pills? Uh, my sense of the evidence is if you get people to be more explicit about these stages, they're more likely to enact the behaviours. Uh, in fact, we're just finishing up um, a major Cochrane review, something like 100 uh, um, action and coping planning uh, trials, um, and it's showing you know, sort of, you know, potentially modest to, um, um, but significant benefits. Uh, make a plan. These are coping plans. So one of the ideas of, uh, of um, this idea of action plan. So the, the, the planning phase is I've got a generalized intention. But if all I have is a generalized intention, I will, there's a strong likelihood I won't enact the behavior. The more you can get me to be, you know, provide concrete ideas about how I'm going to enact the behavior, it either mentally allows me to prepare to do that, but I'm more likely to do it. But you can also probably predict when it's going to be hard for you to continue enacting that behavior. And you can try and get a patient to start to say, well, well how could I overcome um, the practical issues I'm going to face? Okay, so typically if I'm talking about this, I you know, go back to smoking cessation as an analogy. You, know, you, could, you, you don't sort of say, oh, you want to give up smoking? That's great. You go away, come back in six months' time, tell me how you've done. You normally sort of say, okay, well, let's just work it through. When are you going to give up? How are you going to do this? Uh, how are you going to prepare people around you for this? So that's the action plan. But you might also sort of say, well, you know, can you think of times when it might be hard to, you know, when you're going to be really tempted to, to smoke? You know, if I'm in the bar on a Friday evening and you don't have, I think you've moved to a, a smoke free bars here. Um, you know, so your friends are going to go out to have a smoke outside and you want to keep on talking to them and someone offers you one or you're just surrounded by, you know, a great puff of, of nicotine. You know, how are you going to actually sort of somehow address that? So getting people to kind of, Think about what are predictable problems are going to, or, or challenges and address those. Um, we also got with the um, design people into a whole range of areas that I would never think about. We, we, um, you can see that red was the predominant color. And there's a whole set of issues that if it's too red, that's a bad thing. 
Um, but red is still probably kind of quite a good color too. And we spent a whole lot of stuff about um, how you get the envelope. Um, you know, the sense is that if something, if you get an envelope from your, the, the, the suggestion is if you get an envelope from your hospital after discharge, they either want you to complete a patient survey or they want money. Um, so how do you, yeah, so, so that if you kind of really don't want to be bothered, you may not, you may just put it to one side and then not look at it. So how do you actually get people just to try and say this isn't the kind of standard um, um, begging letter from your hospital? So um, hopefully you get the sense of, you know, basically trying to use a systematic approach to intervention design, um, but also then even when you've got a good program logic, thinking about the design features are, I think, something in addition that provide value. You might argue that this is kind of quite easy to do these design things within a within a mail out intervention, but actually people who have come from a design background would say, you know, we can apply our tools and ideas across virtually any type of intervention. You know, so it's actually a way of thinking about the world, often thinking about how humans interact with the world and how the intervention may intrude on that. Um, so you can still sort of potentially get value even if you're thinking about much more complex organizational changes or, or other factors around it. So just in summary, um, intervention design has been the Achilles heel of implementation science. Many interventions continue to be poorly justified, inadequately designed and poorly reported, but I think we can do a lot better. Um, and I think if we actually sort of as a research community take on the idea that we are you know, going to be very sort of rigorous in our thinking to ensure that we know what we're trying to do with our interventions, and we make sure that we, we play that through to the delivery of the interventions, then uh, we're going to have hopefully you know, better information about what we've tested and also better information about potential um, and we can modifiers and generalized roles. So that's it. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we've certainly seen a shift. Um, I think in the early days, in many settings, it was tokenistic, and it really wasn't in any way trying to truly bring people uh, 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 and patients, people living with conditions, as being um, part and parcel of, of the team. Um, I think that is changing. I think the UK, the National Institute of Health Research, and their research um, has really sort of, um, I think, led the way of trying to make sure that you've got meaningful um, um, patient participation uh, 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 um, um, as part of that process. Although, I think there's times where it may or may not, I mean, I, I worry slightly that it may be, we may, um, the value of involving <laughs> patients and also respecting their time may vary across different types of research. Um, we did work with diabetes, uh, funded by the Diabetes UK, um, and they require you to have a patient as part of the team. Great. But we were doing something which was um, basically testing the predictive model of, of, of individual and, and organizational level theories using structured equation modeling. Um, and we had a, a really, really lovely and delightful consumer who came and spent time with us. But I was really worried that this wasn't something that was a good use of her time. Um, but she was willing to give that up. So it was helpful to have her in the room because you, you know, she reminded you, you know, why we're there. But actually, I don't think it's particularly good use of, of her time. I think um, so. So I think one of the things that we need to think about is how we engage and what we engage people for. So um, there's an awful lot of discussion in Canada about co-design, uh, but when I speak to my colleagues in user-centered design, they would argue very care or very strongly that you don't necessarily want to involve the end target in the actual design of interventions. And that's largely because people are not often very good about knowing what actually changes their interventions. So 
getting people to say these are the kind of, this is the kind of the reality of my world and why life is difficult to do this, that's really helpful. Getting people to then road test whether this looks like it's worthwhile doing is useful. But actually the kind of idea that um, if you've got a group of you know, clinicians and patients in the room, if we say, I think we should do this, it wouldn't necessarily mean that they, they don't have, in terms of behavior change, necessarily you know, the, the, the kind of the, the external experience. Um, so I think we need to have probably more nuance about how you, you do this. Um, but in the service, so, so in a research setting, you know, we're now routinely involving um, consumers as part and parcel. So, so in a research setting, you know, we're now routinely involving um, consumers as part and parcel of the process, and they often really bring a lot of added value. Sometimes they kind of keep researchers grounded. And sometimes they also have kind of you know, very, very deep and proud insights about what's important and what needs to be done. In a, in a service provision, um, again, I mean, certainly my hospital, we've just done a major redesign of the cancer services and we had a, a citizen power following that and that had a very strong view. So I think there's a range of activities. I think we're, we're moving from the first blush of, oh, it's always going to be a good idea and, you know, we're very un critical view of this to actually a much more nuanced view about these are these are the circumstances when um, uh, it's going to be most helpful and this is the most productive and respectful way that you can engage you know, um, families, patients living with conditions. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, if you think of the US and how um, the consumer, they target um, advertising to try and get consumer clinician behaviour, not necessarily a good way. Um, but in countries like ours, Canada and Australia, uh, what do you think is the value of our really trying to educate consumers mm -hmm. to know what they really should be asking? How important is that in helping to drive um, behaviour change as a <laughs> It probably depends a little bit on the big characteristics of the of the kind of big clinical conditions and the behaviours that you're trying to do. Um, I mean, I think uh, Rochelle Bookbinder here did the, the mass media campaign about low back pain, which actually led to, to an eight, about an eight percent reduction in X-rays. Yeah, so that's very powerful. And I think the issue there is that actually. Um, when citizens choose to go to the healthcare system, they are making a resource decision. And the healthcare system is not very good necessarily about being rational decision makers around this. So um, there will be time to it's very helpful. We're looking at uh, antibiotic prescribing in general practice. And you know, frankly, if we could stop people going to see their GP, then we would probably have a reduction in antibiotics. Not that when patients go and see their GPs, they actually want antibiotics. But the GPs assume they do. So I think there's value in some areas. It may be, uh, and there's values in terms of um, you know, the early stroke awareness campaigns, in terms of you know, really helping people recognize that this funny symptom might be a stroke and they need to seek help. So in some settings, it's going to be, I think, very helpful. Um, I worry sometimes because historically, what I've seen is trends where Certainly in the UK in the mid-1990s, the idea was if we just give patients information, all of our quality problems will go away. And I think there's times where as patients, well, as patients, we probably vary about the extent to which we want to be proactive in our healthcare. I will also vary over time. So if this is about where I want, whether I want to start, whether I want to have an operation, whether I'm going to have a drug that I'm on for life, I might want to be very engaged. This is about sort of treatment of my you know, perforated ulcer. Do whatever you want, doctor. It's absolutely fine. Uh, and so I think the more we have an engaged group of citizens, the better. But I think that we need to make sure that we're not you know, somehow say, abrogating responsibility for quality and safety to patients. Rather, it's one of the adjuncts for that. And some patients will be active and act and do, do very good. Others may not be. Yeah. <coughs> Yep. Working. How are you able to 
Judaism by mixing or Judaism without permission, and that he would be half Jewish by that himself. So he said to get the Jews to be not Jewish. It doesn't make sense to everybody. It's like in those meetings, the person is allowed to mm. work with the, yeah. the, the, the highest qualifications or what maybe the person who says what's going to happen to the patient. And in my case, I work, my, my husband works for dementia and I work for the part where it's in the. Yeah. So those people often do not have yeah. to work. And so whoever speaks the loudest is the one who's going to be the best mm. route to, to the treatment. So, so I think there's ways of thinking about how you systematize to make sure that consumer or family voices are heard as you're having these conversations. Uh, and what you're reflecting is, even you know, though you know, dementia would be an extreme case of, you know, because a disease is uh, uh, um, um, causing communication difficulties, but we also know from small group processes that there are asymmetries of information, hierarchies of power, that also mean that sort of um, even, you know, even sort of, you know, potentially, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, middle class, very eloquent patients may not in the room be able to engage. So um, there's been a lot of interest in things like um, guideline development about how you might engage consumer voices uh, in a meaningful way. Um, we can immediately start learning from things like uh, social psychology that's looked at small group processes for uh, at least 30, 40 years and find a number of ways in which you can try and address this. Um, I mean, the first is that um, you don't want to have a single consumer or a single, a single representation of a low power, low knowledge group. Okay, you know, so because if you do that, then people are just never going to speak up. You, uh, so you want maybe at least two, you might want to have more around that. You might want to think about what um, individuals, who you want around the table, because consumer, individual consumers often feel, I can express what happens to me, but I don't represent every consumer with my condition. Uh, and so they kind of feel uncomfortable somehow. It's like, well, what do patients living with stroke look you know, think about? I know what it's like for me, but I don't know about everyone else around that. So sometimes you might want to think about um, whether you want to have you know, consumers and then maybe a kind of consumer organization that might have a broader view around that and put the two together. You can also think about, uh, or you'd also, um, you, you can engineer the processes in the group to allow those voices to be heard better. So um, we did some work on small group processes and guideline development in the 1990s and it surfaced a lot of these things and also a lot of the ideas from social psychology about how, how to overcome them. And we started training the, um, uh, um, um, the chair people for guideline groups about how do you make sure that, I mean it wasn't just the consumers, also the GPs, the nurses, you know, it's not just the sort of stroke neurologists who are sort of talking. You know, how do you sort of you know, bring people, you know, allow people to sort of, uh, uh, contribute to move forward? And you can do a number of things. You can think about things like even seating. So, you know, probably put your consumers in eye line vision fairly central to the chair, you know, rather than having the kind of neurologist there and the, so I'm picking on the neurologist, I apologize, and, and the kind of consumers out here where they're never going to feel the view of that. So even if the seating, and then you might want to make sure that you've got opportunities to loop back to consumers. You might want your chairperson to explicitly be looking to the consumers and really creating spaces for them to talk. You might, in the coffee breaks, want to make sure that people are touching base and saying, are you okay? You know, are you happy with how things are going? So there's a range of ways to enjoy engineering the processes. The other thing that you can potentially do you know, as you move further out, and it may be that um, if you're trying to do something to say around dementia, that uh, it might be an example for doing that. First of all, there's increasing research evidence about what are the experiences and issues that consumers face. So you can do systematic use of that evidence. And you could feed that back into the consumer reps in your panel, because that means, okay, this isn't just me. Or you could establish a consumer panel where it was going to be basically just consumer, you know, consumers talking uh, or, or considering the issues being raised in the panel, but in a non-threatening way, in a non-hierarchical way, 
uh, and that being one of the inputs, again, we'll go back to consumer reps. So there's a range of models that I think are kind of, or have been played with. I don't think it's a dominant one, but I, I do think that idea about, as a minimum, think about the social processes and then think about other ways in which you can support the individuals in a group by bringing external, either research evidence or a broader range of external voices to help them feel some more confidence in terms of what they're doing. Yeah, and then. Oh. Sorry, thank you for your presentation. I just had a question about um, implementation framework and the combination of frameworks that we can possibly see in implementation studies. So, for example, the zero economic framework being used with economic control With which, yeah, yeah. I just wondered what your views are on combination of frameworks within studies and whether that advances the field of implementation framework and does it help you set up some of the overlap? Um, so, one of the interesting things was when the consolidated framework for implementation research was first developed, it really wasn't about, it was developed as a descriptive way for looking at context. We went to talk to Laura Damschrader, and the internal context largely, you know, Laura took stuff from everywhere. The internal context maps really well into TDF. Um, I think Laura is trying to develop this, or has been trying to develop this, so it's much more useful for thinking about. Um, planning intervention studies. Um, I I don't have a problem about sort of, you know, combining different you know, things as long as you're thinking about what are the strengths and weaknesses of each. I sometimes see things where we use were and you look at what they did and you have no idea how they used were. And it feels like, yeah, we waved the hanky of this in front of the project. Um, but if we're using them in a critical way to try and make sense, one of the issues around TDF, I think I sort of said, it sort of largely focuses on um, uh, 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 um, what psychology says is important. Um, I was going to try and go back to it. Uh, um, but the um, all of cognitive psychology is in memory, attention, decision-making processes. And if you talk to cognitive psychologists, that kind of feels like a very really mild way of representing the whole discipline. External environment is needs to be exploited hugely, yeah, and that's where things like sort of you know organizational sciences, sociology, anthropology can bring more insights into. So I, I, I mean, I don't think at the moment any of these models are um, sufficiently comprehensive by themselves. Um, so I think starting to combine models thoughtfully is particularly helpful. Being critical as you do that and think about what have we learned by using CIFAR alongside TDF, where are we are, where are the complementarities, how do you actually to, how do you work that through? Um, and just being really intellectually honest with what you know, with what with what's been you know, whether it's been a good or bad experience and, and trying to surface that as much in your in, in what you write up. So so I'm I'm very I will, I think we need to take information from wherever ideas from wherever they might be helpful. I mean, if I'm being flippant, I say, if you have an ology, then you probably have something that, to say that's going to be helpful in the field of implementation science. Um, I'll even allow anonymous for the economists. Um, uh, but we then need to be kind of quite quick as we take some of these ideas in and see what they're actually adding and, and are they helping us. I have here then. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges we have when we try to do um, intervention patients to take their medication is uh, the influence of media. And uh, that trend about certain products might entirely change the way patients receive their treatment, even if the press is going only indirectly related to that situation. Are there any good examples of how people have? address those issues and when it's more partnership with the press to relieve those issues. Uh, people are interested in sort of medication, but when that that also the update and it goes down and it's going to be very powerful. Yeah. Um, so I don't have any great examples. The issue about the press is they're interested in newsworthiness. Okay, so the fact that Angelina Jolie had a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy 
and she was a very, very extreme risk, so that might have been a very appropriate decision for her, um, becomes very newsworthy. And suddenly a lot of women who are, have very different risk profiles are doing this for probably, I mean, they may again be very, they may be right person decisions, but probably not always. Um, I, when I talk to the media, they don't want to be the mouthpiece for someone, however good the message is. Okay? They will be, they're normally very proud about saying, we have an independence. Our job as a media is to look critically at this. Now, you might say in the media news place, newsworthiness, sexiness comes, you know, uh, uh, and actually ends up being sort of uh, uh, very much to the fore. But I think it's, it's actually just kind of really hard to think about doing that. Where you, particularly in the, in the news cycle, in, in the news, um, in, in, in the kind of day to day news cycle, where I think you can probably have better traction is if you start to build relationships with journalists uh, who are doing the regular health columns. Um, you know, the day-to-day -day news media is going to be fed by, you know, the kind of, by, by whatever's coming out and seems high profile that day. Um, and so, and that's going to be driven by, you know, lots of press releases coming from different places, blah, 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 blah. Um, the people doing health columns are often looking for content. Um, and are trying to sort of make sense of this, and they've often got more background in actually thinking about health, because most, um, uh, most health reporting globally is not done by health reporters anymore. Yeah, there's a few people who are really good health reporters, but in general it's done by journalists, and they largely lift what they've been told. That's the reality of it. So I would sort of think about if you want to try and address, use the media, I'd start trying to say, okay, um, on the Wednesday in The Guardian, Who's, yeah, who are the journalists who are kind of reporting there? How do you build a relationship with them? And you know, be you know, so recognise that they will there will be some distance there. They won't necessarily always agree with what you've got to say. But I think it's just part and parcel of the real world that we, we live in. Um, and uh, what we do have on our side is um, you know, patients in general have lots of trust for their healthcare professionals. So some of the issues are, you know, media comes out and then the patient doesn't come to professional. That's a kind of lost opportunity. But I think we have as healthcare professionals opportunities to try and, you know, discuss these things with our patients. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm commenting. So there is an opportunity to make sure that the information that we have is available to the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, you know, potentially, well, I mean, some of the other issues would be, you know, if you want to, you know, try and be responsive to media in terms of this is a, so, was it Mediterranean diet is going to reduce breast cancer by 40%, I think, in the last 48 hours? I don't believe that. Uh, I'm sure we can probably find, you know, 30 counter studies. Yeah, so, I mean, some of the other issues are if you want in your area to actually respond and say, um, you can try and train journalists about what's good evidence, what's bad evidence. Um, you can also, the other issue is we should be honest. There's um, a nice paper, I think, in the Annals of Internal Medicine by um, Lisa Schwartz and Steve Lucian uh, that looked at um, press releases from academic health science centers in the US. On average, it's an academic health science center which produces one press release a week. Um, probably 60% of them are based, are based on basic science stuff. Um, in general, they don't report what the design is. They don't report any sort of caution about what was actually done. Um, so, you know, I think one of the problems with the media stuff is that we as researchers actually are fueling this. Uh, and we need to be honest. It's really hard because, you know, we're very passionate about our own research. Um, you know, and we also have, you know, our funders breathing down our neck. So this was in the... Uh, um, uh, um, um, you know, as reporting the age is probably a good thing to have, um, but I, 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 I think you can't control the media. The media will, all, if you try and control the media, the media will kick back at you. What you can do is try and encourage them to be honest and to try and correct issues, and then to work with, you know, not the front pages, but the kind of the middle pages, um, uh, uh, and, and gain the trust of those journalists. And we 
I mean, the other thing, frankly, and I'm not sure there's times where my research institute makes me angry. Um, yeah, but you could do an audit and look to see whether the press releases from the Flory are good reporting. Mm -hmm. um, I have no, I mean, I have no idea. I know that in my institute, there's times where I kind of see things and think, oh God. Mm -hmm. You know, a rat was saved and they will have a cure for cancer within 10 years. No, we won't. We just know we won't. Um, you know, so I, I, I think there's all, I mean, I, I do think that um, the researchers and the research institutes actually drive a lot of this at this point in time, and that's at least in part because of the expectations of us, um, and we want to sort of have a big splash. So, um, um, you know, I think also we have to be honest with ourselves and try and be honest in, with what we've got. So. It's a really good question. Um, so when you use nudge, there's a big, you know, there's a lot of um, interest in you know, behavioral economic approaches. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are often around improving motivation or getting people to enact motivation. It's only a relatively small component of things that drive our behavior. So that um, I, I, I'd be trying to think more broadly. I would think about, I'd look at the TDS, if I'd also look at um, the uh, um, COMBI, the, uh, another model by Susan Meeky, which uh, you know, says if we want to enact behaviors, we need to have the capability, both physical and psychological, the opportunity, think again, physical and social, and the motivation. Um, now, I don't think there's good kind of filter questions, but you could use some of those models to think would they be helpful, and then just test them out in your in your clinical domain. Um, <laughs> but I know if I talk to Susan Miki, she gets a bit sort of frustrated because the behavioral insight is kind of very sexy. And when you, if you can use that, you know, if you can use those ideas to improve uptake and stuff, that's great. But it's only part of the puzzle that, that, that we've got at this point in time. Um, but there may be other models. I've been seeing other people in the room might have other models like, yeah, this will be really good. So, good. Um, what I'm wondering about is this idea of branding in regards to actual research. Is there something, I mean, I might be totally off the mark, but is there any public industry with how you brand our research studies so that it seems really as though it's done? Um, Worthwhile paying dividends. Uh, it may be helpful. Those sorts of things, but that's sort of got a nudge to it, but it's in the brand. So I just wonder about this. I don't. I personally don't see any problem with with branding. I assume if you're engaging um, human participants, you'd have a, an ethic process where you would provide balanced information about what this entails. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a major, I personally wouldn't have a major problem with that. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think I'm much more concerned about uh, um, 
how we represent the research, the, the results of the research to the outside world and their implications. In general, it's very rare for any individual study to be sufficient to change policy or practice. Um, just, you know, uh, the ISIS-2 trial, um, you know, 10,000 patient randomized trial looking at um, thrombolysis and heart attacks. Yeah, okay, that's, that should change policy and practice. Most research shouldn't. Uh, and we consistently tend to, both in our research publications and then in our going out and communicating with the world, we tend to overstate the importance of the research. And that's largely because it's very hard. So I've just spent five years of my life and I've moved the curve from here to here. That's, I feel really good about it, you know? Um, yeah, and if other people can you know, demonstrate that that's real, then you know, in five years' time, we might be in a position where we could think about whether we should change practice or not. Um, so I, 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 but, but I think some of the potential distrust in um, research is because of the profusion of, bad, of, of the bad representation of research. So a Mediterranean diet will cause uh, will reduce breast cancer by 40 percent. But there's a study published six months ago that mentioned in the age that said that um, drinking coffee um, would do that, or there's something else about that, and so. Yeah, we are constantly sort of bombarding citizens with often very badly unwarranted and uh, over-optimistic claims. Um, yeah, the Andrew Wakefield study on immunization, 12 patients, even if he hadn't made the data up, you still would not have said that you should make any great grandiose claims on a sample of 12 people. Um, you know, and the Lancet should get it. Ask kicked about that on a fairly way that it does. Financial reward is sometimes to that the healthcare professional behavior change? Yeah. I, the answer to that, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, the answer to that, I, I don't know. Um, I think that there would be, there must be a systematic review out there. I think it's an interesting area to consider. What, you know, what I can say is if you look at the healthcare professional field, there's been a huge emphasis on pay for performance. And what you find is that you get you know, some modest improvements in performance if you do pay for performance. It's not a panacea. And one of the issues in the professional behavior change is that um, most, first of all, there's an issue about whether people are driven by intrinsic or extrinsic motivators. Uh, and we're probably, our intrinsic motivators are probably more powerful. But it, uh, you know, when you think about, say, family docs, and you say, okay, well, if you can do this, will they give you a slightly increase in both, whatever else? They're probably working, I don't know, 60, 70 hours a week. They'd like to get home and occasionally see their family. So, you know, actually sort of saying, you know, the, the, we're going to make trade-offs. You know, the, the economic model would be that actually the more money you pay, the more we'll poor. But there's going to be times where we say, actually, I don't care. I've got a reasonable sort of salary. And I don't want to sort of have to spend another 10 hours a week to get 10% more because that means I'm not going to be able to live my life. And so there'll be some of these balances uh, around that. But I, I honestly don't know. I think it would be interesting to to see. I know that um, uh, in South Africa, health insurers, so the big health insurer will give you uh, um, a, a rebate on your insurance um, uh, costs if you eat healthy, which they track by your, your receipts from um, certain supermarkets. So I think it's an area that would be kind of quite interesting to observe. I don't know that evidence space myself sufficiently. I don't know if other people do, but my sense will be it will be helpful, but nothing nothing becomes a panacea. We don't find anything that suddenly says, oh, yeah, this is all we have to do. Um, yeah. Um, just a matter of your last comment on the So I'm interested in views on with the different frameworks. So for the prior framework, just because you don't know, it talks about getting them to different stakeholders involved, getting the context and I'm just thinking, the evidence. 
No, and the, the nature of the evidence. And then you need to know if that's something that's change, which think, is driven more by their experience of experience versus coming from the evidence and bringing it in. So what's your views on the things that it's got a good intuitive sense, but not grounded in the same sort of scientific mm. evidence as like the CDS and Con so have you had experience with that and what are your views on that sort of model framework compared to the more think, Okay, so I think you should think about what do we want from a model. I think we'd like a model to be actionable and then we should test it and see if it's particularly useful and preferably test it against other potential models. So my problem with Parish is that I've not kept up with it. So I have a kind of view about what it was like 20 years ago. Um, but I know that Jill and others have been doing a lot of work to build it up from that. So I don't know the latest state of the parish framework. But what we're trying to do is develop an empirical evidence base. So it's something should be actionable. <laughs> and then if it's actionable and you can build interventions, we should test them and see whether, when we use this framework, is it useful. Then I don't particularly care. If Parish outperforms these other models, and that's great. Um, it probably means you need to theorize around Parish more to work out what's generalizable. But I, I, I think it's about the actionability and testability rather than being fixated on models. One of the problems in psychology is you have people. Are you a psychologist? Yeah. Okay. You have you have it, it, people who who spend their careers in a certain model. And as someone who's interested in behavior change, I, you know, none of these models are comprehensive. So I don't care whether it's you know, Bandura Plus or a bit of Bandura with something over here, blah, 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 blah. I want to have what is the model that's going to lead to you know, the best improvements or improve patient outcome. Um, so I think we just need to be, we need to ensure that um, um, we are testing and then the theory is being driven by testing rather than assuming the theory is right because all of them are partial solutions where we are now. The only other thing I'd say is that I, I uh, um, intuitive models can be good, but if you take the trans-theoretical um, trans framework, hmm? Prochesco and Decrementi, whatever, whatever that is, um, uh, that's something that is such force. So this is the idea that we go through stages if we're trying to change our behavior. Pre-contemplative, contemplative, planning, enacting, maintenance, something like that. And it's got a great intuitive feel. And it's, pro and it's absolutely dominated health promotion and public health for something like 10 to 15 years. Uh, Robert West, who's a psychologist in, in, in the UK, um, published a paper in Addictus saying we should retire trans theoretical framework because it is not theoretically coherent. People don't necessarily go A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes they go straight to E. Oh, bloody hell, how do you do that? Um, yeah, and you know, the difference between A and B might be so subtle. You know, Pre-contemplative, contemplative. When did I kind of work that through? Um, that, so it's theoretically wasn't coherent. That um, if you look at studies that have tried to use the uh, trans theoretical model, to uh, um, drive interventions then compared to non-stage models or compared to placebo, they weren't particularly effective. So we should we should be prepared to kind of test off theories to destruction. And I think if, and if we kill off the trans theoretical model, we've learned a lot <coughs> by doing that. But we shouldn't allow our models should never trump the data. And we should always say to what extent can I, can we you know test our models using data? Because that's the only way that we're going to make, in my mind, useful um, 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 you know, applied models. Whether it's Parrish, whether it's Ian Graham, whether it's Laura Damshada. I'm not really excited about the research. You know, you should also take different combinations of models. So I've had that conversation with Julian, and they have revised their frame. Yeah. And they don't have the model that I used. Yeah. 
structure and what makes the most sense. And then it could be that you're using different components, different models, or a framework with a model. I mean, CDF yeah. is a framework. And then the Paracon is a, is a theoretical. Yeah. Well, you, so you, I mean, theories have different, you've got different levels of kind of theories or theoretical thought. So um, you've got sort of grand frameworks. So things like Ian Graham's knowledge to action is there. And that's kind of, this is how you should think. If you think about the world this way, you know, you, you're probably likely to be more successful, but it doesn't tell you what to do. And again, I guess I'm interested in kind of much more pragmatic and actionable frameworks, things that tell you what to do. So the French model tells me what to do. I can operationalize that. I can put that into two boxes of the engrams bit. I can probably put it into a bit of parish. I could probably put it into pre seed proceed. Um, but I kind of think the models the models we need to work to are the ones who will guide what someone, you know, sitting in their institution and thinking about planning the process, what they're actually going to do and provide the tools for that. So I'm really interested in the actual side, but certainly, you know, so I I'm, uh, I'm yeah, I, as I said, I haven't kept up with what people like Jill and uh, Arsene have done. But 20 years ago, it wasn't particularly actionable. It was a much more of a kind of conceptual framework, which was help. I mean, it was helpful in terms of what it did, but it didn't actually allow me to think about how I could design interventions in a smarter way. Um, and that's kind of what I want from the world. Uh, yes, and then here. Um, so if we think about intervention research, it is actually, I think it is actually about the um, intervention itself. So, yeah, I've done systematic reviews for 20 whatever years. Um, there has been a gradual improvement in reporting the kind of like the quantitative evaluative methods are used, but you still end up with a paragraph and a half describing the intervention. So, I think the kind of the work that Paul Vazio and colleagues did on Tiger and other things are are useful. Um, I'd like a much stronger emphasis about, you know, on the kind of rationale about why people did the things that they did. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, 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 and I have to confess, I think the BMJ has published story, and I haven't, I haven't read that. Um, you know, when I write up a study, I'll probably go and have a look at it. Uh, um, um, but, but I think the the intervention reporting has been pretty awful. Uh, and so then if you're trying to think about, well, what's a generalizable knowledge, you have no idea. You, it's like looking through a sea fog and say, oh, that's a little bit like academic detail. Isn't that academic detail? It's quite academic detailing. Yeah, and it's actually not, and that's really problematic when we do systematic reviews. So that side of things. Um, and and I, I think increasingly, given that we've now got electronic publishing, most even most mainstream journals will have e, e appendices so you can report your intervention in more detail. You can study your publish your protocol of implementation science or trials. You know, twenty years ago it would be you've got eighteen hundred words in the Lancet. That's not the case now. You should be able to actually have a fairly good report of all aspects of what you do within a study. Okay, and then, but then Someone's over here. Oh, hi. <laughs> now you can just say, I, I disagree with everything you said. No, no, I know. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And when I knew that in Tiger, and I was just starting to talk about the topic of the mind of psychology, reading the book, of course, is one of the comments, again, I think when you put people thinking 
ride around what the model is, the frame model is, the two different yeah. yeah. structures, the variables, all of that. Um, the second thing was that um, the use of the admin system framework to do you know, governance and all together, um, you know, I can go to a whole lot of things, but what I see is that um, incidents are being developed in our outdoor at the moment, very much, which is great. And then they're looking and the researchers are looking to see what does that information work. So there's, you know, there's not a lot. I don't see a lot of room down to what element of that information actually yeah. works. You can look at the actual investment plan and the sort of identity and all of these different things. Um, knowledge dissemination tools really, but in the end, you might be doing a you know, five page brochure that's covered all of those things, but in the end, you've got like a designated one page flyer. How do you identify, you know, identify which is the actual active information you want? There's multiple yeah. things. So, so absolutely agreed. Okay. Um, what, if you if you went no, if you went back historically, what you'd get is just an intervention, it's like a scrunch of stuff. Uh, oh, we had this black box did something. The kind of approach here, the French approach, will lead you to kind of probably a fairly careful elucidation elucidation of what you think the you know, potential active mechanisms are and how you think you're addressing them within your intervention. What we are increasingly doing is um, embedding what we call theory-based process evaluations. So we think that our intervention is working by activating the following pathways, and let's measure those pathways alongside the trial. So did we activate the pathway that we thought we did? Did that lead to the behavior change that we've got? So trying to sort of unpack the black box by sort of saying it's not just a a scrunch of things together. You know, there were kind of five elements or goals of the of the intervention. Um, we did we managed to hit self efficacy, but actually there's no you know, behavior change quite suggested. Um, you know, that was necessary but insufficient or whatever. So we um, so so we're, we're trying to do that. I mean, I, I so I'm, I'm a trialist. I believe trials are robust. You know, the robust mechanism to look the causal. Um, uh, uh, well, um, causal description did A lead to B. What trials don't give you is causal explanation, how under what circumstances did A lead to B. And given we've got complex interventions that point in complex contexts, the more we actually understand that, the better. So alongside the trial, I'm now trying to build a range of other forms of inquiry that will you know, give a lot more sort of flesh around that relationship. So some of those things would be fidelity. You know, to what extent was the intervention delivered with fidelity? Now, in a pragmatic trial world, I don't think we should be pushing fidelity, but it helps you with the interpretation. We got this benefit by achieving 60% fidelity. So if you can achieve 60%, you can do that. If you can only achieve 20%, yeah, you know, that's going to be a problem for you. So it's much more of an interpretive model than in an efficacy trial. Then these theory-based process evaluations, um, some sort of more traditional grounded process evaluations to capture unanticipated sort of uh, issues. Uh, and then the other, um, the other piece of work I've been very influenced by, there's um, uh, people know Mary Dixon Wood, she's a sociologist in Cambridge, just a, again, like Susan Meekin, she's one of my gods, um, an Irish god living in Cambridge. Um, but she had a wonderful paper in the Millbank Memorial Quarterly, which was about um, how do you bring the learnings of trying to deliver a program back into the program theory? Yeah, so if you take the French model, yeah, I've got, yeah, I develop the skeleton of what the intervention will do. We then go out and try and deliver that in the real world, and we'll actually learn from the, yeah, our experience of doing that, and that has to be fed back into our understanding about what the program is. And she used, um, there's an intensivist in the US called Peter Provenost who had a, a fairly famous study in, in uh, Colorado where they're trying to reduce the use of, um, uh, into uh, of, of, of arterial catheters. Uh, and Peter had a very clear, there are five things my intervention is, and they could demonstrate that across a whole state of reduction in the use of indwelling catheters. Um, but Mary, from talking to Peter, worked out that 
there was kind of a, you know, there was a lot more, or she thought there was a lot more going on. Um, so, what, and as an example of that, um, one of the elements of Peter's model is they bring together one nurse from each intensive care unit uh, every six months to discuss how things are going. And if you've been to a meeting in America, when they say that, what they normally do is fly you into some sort of godforsaken airport hotel and sort of say, there's a subway five miles that way, we'll see you in the morning. Okay, it's not, they're normally not very sort of warm and welcoming. Peter Provenos decided we should you know, do something for the nurses. They're doing this travel. We'll give them a wine and cheese on the you know, when they arrive. And over time, and Mary's view as a social scientist, but I completely agree, this probably became a very profound part of the intervention. Nurses would fly in and they would develop a peer group. There was a kind of a social support mechanism. They could bitch about how it is, and they could probably also, I tried this, or oh, we tried that, or did other things around that. And so, you know, Mary's argument would be that if you just describe had Peter's five steps, um, but you, for example, didn't bring in the nurses into a social environment where they could get support, they could trade ideas, then you're probably not fully representing the intervention as delivered. So I also think there's that kind of idea about as we deliver them, being critical about what worked, what didn't work, um, what else do we need to think about? And it might be a second wave of this, as you sort of say, do we have to bring the nurses in or not? But you have at least hypothesized that this was part of the activity. So we're kind of trying to build these things around um, as we as we as we design these these trials. Um, um, so we're getting the most out of them. Because I mean, they're expensive ventures, and often these sort of other you know these, the additional cost of doing this stuff is not huge, um, but the additional value of the information is huge. We've got one last. Thank you very much for coming out today. And, you you realise um, I've gone to Toto since we last. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm teasing. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> 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 Got lots of stories about that. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, plenty of food for thought for everyone. It's um, been very interesting and um, very much appreciate your time today. Good.